I kind of look back on what I think is, is important and what some of the things that, as a society, we should be addressing, and especially the wings of society to do with quality and industry. And it's got a rather facetious title there, Business Planning, Why Bother? Partly because I've worked in a number of companies as consultants, as a consultant, I've done in-house courses and things. I've taught forecasting and business planning to industrialists, and they don't seem to use it. And I'm going to give an account as to why I think there's a problem between the community of s statisticians and the, practi the practitioners. Of course, statisticians can be practitioners. It's all to do with uncertainty, which for me is what statistics has always been about. It's a science of trying to understand uncertainty, try to measure it, try to quantify it, and try to do something about it, or at least know when you can't do things about it. But when uncertainty increases, it seems to me that equates to irrationality. People panic and think, oh goodness, our sales are down compared to what it was a month ago. <coughs> Let's sack the CEO. He had a great plan. <coughs> it's not working. And that does seem to be how it, it goes. And um, <laughs> there we go. So as uncertainty increases, often business growth goes down. When business growth starts to falter, then that leads to the next issue of confidence. Plans were made. They even took the five-year plans. But as soon as growth falters, confidence goes down, it doesn't matter how much evidence there are to support the plan. It seems nobody gives it time anymore to see what will happen. And I think the big drivers of uncertainty are to do with changing world power. People, businesses are working with different people, different cultures than they used to. Climate change, maybe, maybe not. But it's an uncertainty, and certainly it's going to cause things. But a big driver that's been there for at least 100 years, moving gradually through the so social time technical system, is population change. People haven't grasped it. Actuaries and statisticians told people about this right from the, the beginning of statistics as a profession. It was said that you need to pay attention to your populations. Fertility and mortality rates. That seems to have been forgotten about. Oh, there was a big panic in the 70s and 80s. The world's population's too big. It, we have to try and encourage developing countries to reduce fertility. They've pretty well done it. And now it's got, my goodness, who's going to look after the older people in Bangladesh? Who's going to buy the goods? Okay, Bangladesh is so populous, it's not around that people to do the work. But this whole idea of the shifting balance of consumers hasn't really been thought of. And the other one is technological change. Technological change, as you know, has always been there, but maybe people are getting less control of it. So, change in world power. As you all know, as an economy, China has now overtaken the US. Although the US might argue not quite, but according to the OECD statistics, they have. So the red line is the growth of China. The blue, fairly straight, sloping line there is the US. Um, and the one that's coming up is India. And the UK is continuing to grow and keep its share, despite what the press says. The I was going through a lot of um, economic forecasts made by the IMF, World Bank, OECD, for long-term forecasting is, as you know, guesswork in many ways, but 
all the independent forecasts are put in the UK quite well placed. And they can back it up by showing that the UK, for whether we're in Europe or not, should still outpace Germany because their structural and social systems are not that flexible. And they're over again um, outsourcing work overseas. And of course, with autonomous cars, what's going to happen to their car industry? Will people buy cars in 20 years' time or 30 years' time? You'll just summon a thing on an app and it comes. You won't need to own it anymore. So BMW, Mercedes, what are they going to do in the future? Well, make the, the gizmos, I guess. But uh, yeah. The other problem here is widening inequalities across the world. The growth countries, the ones that are piling on the resources, are doing well. But it's getting more and more difficult for the so-called semi-development countries, the BRIC countries now, now to compete. They're losing market. They, they're not getting access to the investments they require. So there's this increasing inequality. However, there's plenty of time to do it because if you represent the data rather than just how strong the economy is, but per capita, it's a bit different story. In terms of um, here, the red line's the UK. We're still becoming a very affluent country and the forecasts do look like the UK per capita GDP will keep on rising and we're going to be hovering around Germany and things. India, the so-called growth of, the, of Asia and um, China, there's so many people there that they're never going to have the individual spending power that they, they do in the currently strong countries. So the time to react to this change. But I don't think there's much time to do much about population aging. We're moving to a situation where in the UK will soon be 30% of the population over 65. And rising, raising the pension age isn't going to fix things. The idea of people planning for the future is all getting mixed up. The social system is becoming problematic. The, in this chart here, it's shown that population aging really was a province of Northern Europe, but not anymore, because um, now it's moving that China, lot, quite a lot of Asia are now aging quite quickly. And uh, so these had social systems that very much depended on the family. If the family's not there to look after the people, it's going to be quite problematic. They can't always do, which I was speaking to um, a demographer from Germany, they're opening up old people's, um, well, they're not homes, they're cities or towns in Namibia because they're getting cheap labour. It was a farm in German colony, they speak German, and it's a nice place to live. Where can older Indians go? So the impact of ageing is, as you can see, there's the UK. Gradually, it's getting fatter at the top of the population pyramid. There are going to be a lot more older people. They're going to be the consumers. Okay? If they're not consuming from themselves, they're consuming for their, their children. Or they're consuming for their grandchildren. They're buying them things and helping them out get started with houses. But that, I think, can only go on for a little while. There are increased risk adversity. I don't care, I, mean, I don't mean to be ageist, I can't be ageist, I'm old, but <laughs> it doesn't matter how you look at it, generally older people are less likely to take risks, less likely to invest in the future. So there, there are challenges. More single households, right? The, the growth of single ownership means a lot of the housing stock isn't particularly great. 
I live in Edinburgh. I've got quite a nice flat. It's quite a big one. I live in Moen. But it's cold. It's drafty. It's, it's badly designed. It might have been good when it was built 150 years ago, but it's no good for the modern Scottish winters. Um, <coughs> and the workforce implications are going to be quite severe. Just mentioned about the housing stock needs to be sorted out. One of the major contributors to UK GDP is co the construction sector. It's running out of people. There are major skill shortage there, and they can't get, for one reason or another, they're not getting enough young people in to take up posts of apprenticeships and so forth. They've got a um, diversity problem. There are very few women in the construction sector. Um, there's no reason why there shouldn't be more women in the construction sector anymore. It's no longer physical, hard, grueling work. It can be tough, of course, but it's not that bad. And we've done a report recently exam trying to examine why there are um, not more women in construction industry, and a lot of it, is to do with employers and how people are employed in the construction sector. It's word of mouth. Okay, the big companies will do all the proper HR advertising and things, but generally it's word of mouth. And girls' parents socialise them in to stay away from construction, even if their parents were in the construction industry. And the same is true for the IT sector. It's running out of people. We're not producing enough IT graduates who are going into um, various IT and derivative jobs. And one of their big pushes was to try and increase more women in construction. At university, there are almost as many women doing computer studies as men. Or, but they don't go into the business. And it's not because there's something nasty in the business. There have been various surveys done. My group's done ones as well. The women who are working in the, se in the sector don't feel, victimi feel victimized or harassed. The notion with that many people keep saying that it's an anti-child industry because if you have a career break, you lose your skills. The ones we spoke to who came back never found that. Once you learned how to code, once you learned how to use the systems, it's not that hard to pick it up again. There is a bit of a problem with the kind of deadline culture that everyone leaves things to the last minute and then works all night and all weekend to try and fulfill the, the contract. But that's maybe more of a problem for organisation. So I can skip that one. The next challenge that's facing the things that people really need to think about is automation. Okay, I um, was involved in things back in when I was finishing my honours degree. It came out with this book, The Mighty Mi Micro, about integrated circuits. I was going to get the paperless office, throw everyone out of work. It never happened. And certainly my office got more paper in it than it ever had. But this time, because you can get artificial intelligence and self-learning, I think they're a real challenge to employment. And some of the, the forecasts made by the mainly US Bureau of Labor is that about 47% of people's jobs are going to be at risk. So that's got huge implications for society. The areas that have most impact, I think, is transport. You get the news reports about the autonomous cars and everyone gets kind of excited. But the real thing is, what's going to happen to the, the car manufacturing sector? It's going to be really badly hit and things will be produced or machines will be produced in a much more automated way because they'll all be electrical. They won't have so many moving parts. They won't be owned by people. The idea of luxury vehicles for many people might go because there'd be no point in owning them. Accountants, 
once seen as a the great profession, looks like it's it's really hovering on the edge of extinction. Um, many service jobs will go. The idea of even getting a burger, you just go and the machine will give you it. They've got places in the US that are doing that. I've seen one, but I never tried it. Um, and of course, there's the um, Stephen Hawkins comment that the real danger is that once the machines start thinking, thinking for themselves, they'll figure out that they're more efficient than we are, and they won't need us. And once you get self-replicating code and self-design code, there are big challenges there. So we need to think about how work is going to be organized, where it'll be located, but I think more importantly, how are we going to have a surplus of in the economy? How are people going to be able to buy the things the machines make? So the whole economic system is under a lot of threat by, from rising powers elsewhere, from people being older, and machines going to start to do more and more. And even in the caring sector, Japan seems to be really pushing robotization for care workers, and they're having some success. So there doesn't seem any pr particular profession that's immune to this. And that was just a thing I got from the US Department of Labor. Um, the fastest growing jobs, at least, that, that one's statisticians, they reckon. So it might be you have to go to the US to get a job. But the sad thing is, compared to other things like nurse practitioners, on average the salaries are about 20% less for statisticians in the US. <coughs> and that's just, oh, skip on that. Isn't there a nice website on the BBC, will a robot take your job? Well, there's only a 15% chance that um, actuaries, economists and statisticians will be put out of work. But there are other web things that do this as well. And I did see one that was 22% likelihood that statisticians would be put out of work. So we need to, to think about the future. And climate change, so much nonsense in climate change. Um, I teach research methods and one of the things I do is um, they have all these proxy indicators of ch climate change and they've got one about um, amphibians and reptiles that are breeding later. And a bit of slide up of about a dozen frogs and lizards and things. For every one that breeds earlier, there's an equivalent that's breeding later. So there are no, the measures are all over the place. But I do like the NASA website because it's, it is a bit more harder hitting. And it's kind of like they're going to be things happening. It may well be attributed to people because of the rise in carbon dioxide, but whatever. Looks like um, water levels are going to rise, things are going to get drier, be less severe winters. And we need to think about that because it's clearly going to impact <coughs> logistic things. When I did my PhD a long time ago, it was on demographic change, and it was to try and look at the, or model socio-technical change, and will it kind of look back over what happened at different major changes in society. So the first thing was hunter-gatherers to an ag agricultural regime. All that did was create more jobs and allowed the human population to expand. Agriculture to industrial, big trauma, awful messy at the beginning, but created more jobs, better jobs, led one way or another to increased well-being. And now we're at the end of the industrial thing and we've been into the service knowledge economy, but every time there's been a change like this, the change occurs quicker. So maybe we're reaching the end of this current service knowledge thing and we're in another state of transition. And I think in the state of transitions, there are a lot more uncertainty. And 
businesses, people don't know what to do to plan for the future. With variability in all systems increase, decision making is difficult. Control is difficult. And they often try to get more and more control, but there's some views that if you control, remove all the variability, if things start to move a bit, they break the system. So you get a kind of chaotic response. Irrationality begins to dominate. You get celebrities become important. All the kind of junk you see in TV now. Um, but measures get ignored and businesses panic. Now, if we can't handle Brexit and all its uncertainty, how is the UK, how is the rest of Europe going to handle these bigger changes that are coming? It's quite clear that automation is going to increase. It's quite clear aging is going to keep going for a while. And um, you're not going to stop other countries growing in power. So we need to start thinking more about these things. So my view is we need to return to proper scientific methodologies that are based on applying scientific methods to business planning. Just even straightforward deeming. Plan, do, study, act. It would it's designed to remove irrationality and get people to take their time, make a plan, implement it, see what happens, and act on it. Either revise the plan or move on. So, I am not making any apologies. I think the scientific methods work for a long time. That's what should be used. We need to understand variability and stop people getting excited by one or two deviant points, which I think is the great danger of this big data revolution. Everything I've seen, it's always they're ignoring the mass of the data and getting excited by one or two deviations. And how much you'd like to bet a whole business <coughs> on a few deviations, I don't think that's very sensible. So there's a need for more reasoned argument, but there are problems. The first problem is theory practice gap. The theory's been produced. People have shown how to do things, but they don't get implemented. People still like, or decision makers still like to go on hunch. They seem to think if they get it right, there's something God-given or special about them. For over 30 years, I've been involved a bit in statistical forecasting. Papers were published on the theory practice gap to show that if you were to use statistical forecasting for short-term planning, it was much more efficient and judgmental. And in longer term, fitting trends and things was usually a good thing to do. But it was quite clear people didn't keep records very well. There was very little good historical data in many companies. When they were told to keep it, they kept it for a bit and then got fed up. Maintaining data is a hard thing, and they don't see the money in it right away. So they might, th they might be s told to do it, might start doing it, but because there are no quick gains, it often gets abandoned. They overreact to the ra random fl fluctuations and um, tr will put their faith on other things, either consultants or big data. The other one is universities. I work at a university and they'll probably shoot me when I go home, but they've lost their way. British universities are still, or many of them are still top in the world, and that's good. But they're more and more just after a quick buck. <coughs> they're trying to get overseas students' fees, UK student fees. They do popular courses rather than courses or programs that, are, 
the economy needs. They've kind of lost their vision, and as a taught discipline, statistics is disappearing. I work in a business school. They don't teach undergraduate statistics anymore. They have a little bit of arithmetic in the beginning uh, first year, but they're very, very little elsewhere. We used to have a, a master's in statistics. <coughs> that was, was not continued because it wasn't recruiting big numbers. By big numbers, we're looking for intakes of 30 to 50 at least. We were getting 20 odds and that was fine. They stopped us teaching statistics to third year classes because it was failing them all. And you go and give the hard evidence. No, look, <coughs> our pass rates are good. Then I get the statement, yes, but they've had to work so hard on yours, they've had to reduce, they hadn't had time to study for their other subjects. So it's crazy. Um, <coughs> so if you look at the supply side, where in last year, where the bulk of the students were in the UK were in creative arts and design and business and administrative studies. Statistics wasn't listed separately, but mathematical science, 1.8%. And medicine and dentistry, the kind of high paid one, was just over 2%. But again, that's a resource intensive thing. But that's the salaries. <coughs> <coughs> this is salaries, average salaries one year after somebody finishes a me medicine or dentistry course. And that's it after 10 years. For mathematical sciences, one year after, they're a bit lower than the, the, dent me the medics and the dentists, but 10 years later, they're moving up. They're clear demand for mathematical science graduates. Yet, Universities aren't investing in them. Instead, they're recruiting business and administrative studies, whose initial start salaries are lower and stay lower 10 years after. And creative arts and design, same story. They're not, they're not making money. They're not in demand by business. And I think th that's quite telling, that we're focusing education in the wrong direction, and finally, the media. The media seems to be moving to the lowest common denominator. Celebrities are important, not empty of reason. It encourages and facilitates contagion, spreading rumour, and all the rest of it. Um, the whole notion of social media and things, which I think is quite a lot of hype. I'm doing some work with a major insurance company in, the, in Edinburgh, and they've been investigating how to uh, make money out of the market. And people tried to sell them all these things, and they got some people from America to say, well, let's look at company reports and how they're put in Twitter and all the rest of it. They've looked at the effect of bringing in social media information to their planning and they find none. It has no impact on long term or one week share prices unless it's something catastrophic that's getting reported, which would be reported anyway in the, the media or they'd be aware of. They tend to be statistically and arithmetically enumerate. Um, so, I don't think the media, which is one of the most powerful bits of the establishment, are doing things any favour. And that's it. So, I'm meant to do something a bit more um, statistical, but when I started putting it all together, I got carried away in my rant. <laughs> so, my apologies for you for that, but I have now left it as we need solutions. So, <laughs> Tony's going to come in. Solve things. There's two things I want to disagree with him on. Ooh. Only two. <laughs> One, he said he wasn't doing much statistics. I thought he did a lot of statistics, much more than I'm going to do. 
And number two, he said, I've come up with solutions, and I'm not, under any circumstances, going to touch solutions. That's miles too difficult. So what I want to talk about is um, a different aspect, if you like, but a related aspect of this unpredictability that, that we're facing. I'm going to talk about black swans. How many of you have heard of the black swan phrase? Can I just get a feel for this? Yeah, everyone. You see, we all know what a black swan is. A rare, unpredictable, allegedly high-impact event, like the financial crisis. And yet it was predictable, really, wasn't it? Okay? And that's the dilemma, if you like, around it. But in a world with black swans, if we rely on prediction, if we believe our predictions, and we, of all people, shouldn't really <coughs> believe our predictions, then we're going to come unstuck, I would suggest. Okay? So I want to talk about that briefly as I try and work out... Oh, there we go. And find the right buttons. Let's try that one. Yeah. So, uh, as advertised, what I want to talk about is the fact that statisticians have long considered decision-making under uncertainty and risk, and we separate these ideas. I'll, I'll cl clarify that in a minute. But how should we approach decision making in a world where we now recognise the importance of black swans, these unpredictable, low probability, major impact events, and the financial crisis is the classic? Now, it's argued that we can't include them. No one could have predicted the impact, we say. Okay, so you can't include them. On the other hand, we can't really ignore them. They invalidate all our predictions. In fact, they invalidate everything we do, essentially. We've been talking about, you know, following trends in what I've been hearing. We've been talking about we might not be that good at following trends or that decision-making hasn't been based on following trends. But the argument with black swans is that anyway, if you follow trends, you may well get the wrong answer because we've got these discontinuities in what's going on. It comes into question, I would suggest, a lot of what we do in statistics with prediction. And we haven't paid much attention to that, I don't think, as a profession. So I want to talk about that a bit. It's quite an interesting debate about whether black swans are predictable or unpredictable. There's views of both. Okay. So how can we extend our methodology, whatever our methodology is, to cover black swans or in a world in which black swans exist. That's my interest. And I'll work out the right button. There we go. So let's just talk about the classic, the history, you know, the stuff we teach in decision-making courses. Decisions under certainty, decisions under uncertainty, decisions under risk. And now I want to talk also about decisions in the presence of black swans in a world which we can conceive of black swans. So certainty is very easy, isn't it? You know, we all know what happens under certainty. We know exactly everything laid out. We know what's going to happen. We know the right decision to make. Although the way we make that decision most of the time is kind of usually based on a sort of an averaging process a lot of the time, implicit in what we're doing, often a cost calculation which in a world in which extreme events may be more important is probably the wrong thing to do anyway. But nevertheless, we've got methodology for certainty. It's all very straightforward. We understand the relationships. There's not much to talk about. In <coughs> fact, it's not even for us. Certainty is outside our world. We, we go into a different world, don't we? And, and we, we, we deal with this issue of uncertainty and risk. Now, I was looking back to where I could find the first reference on uncertainty as a concept in its own right, and it seems to come back to Maynard Keynes. And it's an interesting quote from 73. By uncertain knowledge, let me explain, I do not mean merely to distinguish what is known for certain from what is only probable, the game of roulette is not subject in this sense to uncertainty, nor is the prospect of a victory bond being drawn. Or again, the expectation of life is only slightly uncertain. Even the weather is only moderately uncertain. The sense in which I'm using the term is that in which the prospect of a European war is uncertain, or the price of copper, or the rate of interest 20 years hence, or the obsolescence of a new invention. About these matters, there is no scientific basis on which to form any calculable probability whatsoever. 
We simply don't know. Which takes us beyond that world of risk where we can talk about knowing what the potential outcomes are and, 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 and talking about probabilities with them. So we can talk about, we know all the alternatives in a world of risk and we can predict the probability of an outcome. But the uncertainty, we don't know all that. Risk can be measured and quantified whilst uncertainty cannot be. So black swans then are kind of part of that uncertainty world, but they've got a kind of special feature as well. The high impact, very low probability, if we can put a probability on them at all, and allegedly, according to some good thinkers, unpredictable. Now, we know what to do with decision-making under uncertainty. That's pretty easy. We've got decision rules that will take us through problems like that. Again, we're relying often on expectation to take us through them, and expectation when we've got probabilities and distribution with long tails can be extremely dangerous, but nevertheless, we, we know what to do. It's all very straightforward. But what do we do with these strange black swan events, these things that were so off, off the wall that we couldn't predict them. We couldn't even think about them, we couldn't even conceive them. So, in a way, black swans are a special case of uncertainty. Let's talk about what they are. Now, one of the things that's very interesting about black swans is we have very, very limited theory about them. There's been attempts to model them. Um, and you could say that the attempts to model them predate the concept, although the concept of the black swan appears to go back at least to Elizabethan times. Before black swans were discovered in Australia, we were using black swans as a concept, a mythical event, of something outside expectation. It was being used in the way we use it now then, interestingly enough. Which is why if you go to Stratford, you've got the black swan pub opposite the theatre also called the Dirty Duck. Right. So, low probability, high impact, unpredictable of it, very little theory. I've got an interest in the theory of this. This is, um, in fact, a fantasy author, that's Jasper Ford. We ran a joint event here with Jasper Ford, the quality improvement section, I think last year. Because Jasper came up with the idea in one of his fantasy novels of the idea of expectation influence probability. And, that, and this idea fascinates me. It's the idea that actually our definitions of probability are too naive. In reality, when we talk about probabilities, we're normally talking about probabilities in a world in which we've got human actors. And if you've got a world with human actors, what people expect's gonna happen affects their decisions no matter what we do with an expectation-based model, it's actually their expectation that matters. So, for instance, if I think you are a star salesman, I'm likely to support you as a manager, and you're more likely to be successful. We have a feedback loop. <coughs> right? Okay, it's a virtuous circle. If, on the other hand, I do a risk assessment and discover a threat, I'll mitigate against the threat, hence reducing it. So I've got a balancing process, a reducing process. So actually, when we work with probability, we always work with probability in a world in which we've got people, by and large, and wherever we've got people, we've got this link between what we think is going to happen and the probability that it does happen, and we take action, directly or indirectly, to change that probability. So the probability changes. Now, the one thing which is really interesting about black swans is we don't think it's going to happen. We haven't conceived of it. So it's kind of an extreme example of expectation influence probability. But they do happen. They keep happening. I used to keep assembling this slide, you know, sort of on a weekly basis, but after a while I gave up. So this is a bit old and out of date now. But in here we have all kinds of interesting sort of black swans, financial crises. Um, we have stuff about the House of Commons in there somewhere, BP. We had loads of things. Lots of unexpected, low probability, high impact events. 
which as you think about it in the world we now live, seem to be happening all the time. I mean, don't you agree? Do you think Brexit, maybe, the whole position we're in now, actually kind of represents that? How we got to this place? In some sense, I think we sort of had a black swan. We didn't expect that referendum. We certainly didn't expect the referendum result. Okay? Which makes you wonder about prediction, doesn't it? And the value of prediction. Well, I know I shouldn't be saying this to statisticians. So it raises the question of what sort of decisions we should be attempting to make in a world of black swans. Now, I would argue that the sort of decisions which are prediction-based decisions are not a good idea. Because what we should be doing in making decisions is very much protecting against disasters if we're in a world <coughs> of black swans. And if we're going to protect against disasters, relying on a prediction which ignores the black swan events it takes no account to the mechanisms associated with the black swan events, by definition, is inadequate. Okay? And particularly if we want to protect ourselves against a disaster. I do think we still can make decisions, but the decisions we can make I would call more management-based decisions rather than prediction-based decisions. What do I mean by a management-based decision? Well, we can, for instance, apply precautionary principles. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what the black swan is or when it happens or if there is one. But we do know there are certain things which are real risks which we just shouldn't be even considering doing. So, an example of a precautionary principle? Well, we don't know what the next major epidemic is going to be but we do know that basic hygiene is a good idea. We do not know where we're going to create massive pollution necessarily, but we do know that storing certain things in the ground is not a good idea. And we know also that having ball directors who don't have a stake in the company is probably not a good idea as well. There's a lot of precautionary principles. We can borrow from environmental management the idea of precautionary principles, and it kind of creates a world in which Instead of thinking about predicting, we're thinking kind of a different way around. We're thinking about protecting against what we don't know. Okay. Now, I want to talk about antifragility, um, and I will briefly talk about it in a minute. Antifragility is due to, as a concept, is due to a guy called Nassim Talib, who was a New York trader who predicted the financial crisis number of people did. Okay? To be fair, he didn't quite predict it. He thought it might happen. And he took precautionary principles. Each year, out of his earnings, he gambled a bit on a financial crisis happening. He invested a small amount of money. It didn't cost him much. He got very good odds. Nobody believed in it. And then it happened. And he made his fortune. He gave up trading full-time, joined New York University. Wrote a book called The Black Swan. I got interested in him a bit later when he wrote another book called Anti-Fragility. Anti-Fragile, to be precise. Now, the idea of anti-fragile, as we'll come to, is the idea that what we actually need are systems in our organisations which are a bit like those robots we all seem to be scared of in artificial intelligence, which actually get stronger by being stressed. The way we tend to think about the world and systems in, in organisations is we think about the protection against something you can't think of is having a robust system. So we make it strong. Now, of course, however strong we make it, there's always, as it were, something bigger than it. Whilst when I exercise, I get stronger within limits. Shouldn't we be focusing on developing systems and organisations that get stronger. Okay? And indeed, precautionary principles are part of that, but the other one, obviously, is horizon scanning. Instead of predicting, we should be looking, perhaps, at the range of possibilities, the extremes that we might be facing. Instead of worrying about particularly point estimates or central ranges, Skin in the game. We 
shouldn't have board directors without skin in the game. So here's Nassim Talib with notably a black swan round his neck. Fragile refers to systems and organisations that are easily fragile, are, e are easily damaged by external shocks. Robust refers to ones that are, can withstand such adverse conditions up to a limit. And anti-fragile refers to systems and organisations like biological systems actually get stronger from being stressed. When I exercise, remember, I get stronger. On the left, it's not Talib's book, it's my book on the subject. I, I, see, I got really inspired by Talib and I looked at how we could apply this in organisations. Talib's arguments are quite general. At the top is Talib's concept here. If you've got a fragile item, you want to handle it with care. If you've got an anti-fragile item, you want to do the opposite. We want to stress test it. We want to cause as much diversity of threat to it as possible. The only way we're going to make it stronger is by doing that. Now, there are different types of systems, of course. There are natural systems and there are man-made systems and our models are man-made too, of course. A man-made system or a model, however complex it is, is much simpler than a natural system. It's got a lot less interfaces with its external environment. It's got a lot less interfaces internally between its subcomponents. And the interesting thing about organisations is that they have characteristics of both natural and man-made systems. So in organisations we tend to have artificial rules of how things are going to work. We have departmental structures, we have procedures, we have simplifications. Whilst we also have the fact that it's the people and their soft relationships and the motivation which actually keep it alive and working despite those systems. So we have aspects of the natural system tied up particularly with the people and we have aspects of man-made systems the blueprint of the organisation, the infrastructure of the organisation. So you've got characteristics of both. Now remember biology has this anti-fragile characteristic and the classic example of that, of course, is the cat, isn't it? You know? um, it's the idea that you can drop a cat from three stories and it will survive. I have to say I haven't tried it. Right? But you can drop an elephant from one story and it will die. Because its own weight will destroy it. Okay? And the difference between fragile and anti-fragile, in the middle, resilient or robust is that characteristic of biological systems that it grows and gets stronger from the volatility around it. So if you like, we've got the sword of Damocles on the left, we've got the phoenix arising from the ashes, and then on the right, where well, you can see really the hydra. Cut off a head, and we get two, or ten, or whatever. Okay? Now what we need, I would suggest, is anti-fragile systems. So the problem with robustness is, of course, the TENS barrier, isn't it? Uh, the TENS barrier, pretty robust, although actually, unfortunately, not strong enough and not big enough. And we're only waiting, I don't know what the statistic is, but we are expecting a freak wave to basically breach it, and we lose, what is it, up to a third of London, the low-lying areas of London at that point. Now here, I think, maybe not here. Right? So there's no practical level of robustness which is strong enough. We can't place a limit on it. And obviously robust systems don't themselves get, be get uh, better. Resilience or robustness is only waiting for the bigger wave to demolish it. Okay? Now, I would suggest prediction is failing. We've, we've had so much evidence of prediction is failing in recent years, it's unbelievable. Um, the three areas, I think, where this shows really, really strongly, risk analysis. We keep doing risk analyses, and yet we keep having massive failures of systems. There's books and books on it. 
and yet we're doing the same procedure using ISO 31000 or similar to do those risk predictions. But they fail consistently from the fact that you can't actually include a risk in a risk analysis unless you can conceive of it. When in the world of black swans, that's a joke. You can't conceive of it. We know that. Black swans, unpredictable. And then bubbles. Bubbles are a lovely example of the same theory, essentially. We all love bubbles because we can make money out of them if we're a trader. But the trick is knowing when to stop. Knowing when to start and knowing when to stop. And we try all kinds of prediction methods for that, and they completely fail. So I think prediction is failing, and, and I'm, I, I'm very affected by um, a concept due to Eli Goldratt. Goldratt was the guy, or one of the authors, of a book called The Goal in the 1980s, which really transformed how manufacturers thought about production. It was a book about lean and a bit more than lean methods. And, and one of his bits of later work, Eli Goldratt, was the theorem of disappearing clouds. Now, briefly put, the theorem of disappearing clouds says, if an issue has no solution, then you've formulated it wrongly. Okay? So... If prediction keeps failing, we don't have a solution to it. Maybe we're looking at the wrong thing. Maybe it sh we shouldn't be predicting. Maybe we should be thinking about decision-making in a different way. <coughs> maybe we should be thinking about precautionary principles, for example. And maybe we should be looking at more information. So if you try and think about this as a unified theorem, what we've got here is things we can see and things we can't see inside our vision and outside our vision, and things that happen and don't happen. Now, if it's inside our vision and it doesn't happen, that's what we talk about in a risk analysis as a risk or a hazard. Something that might happen sometime. And we include it in a risk analysis. If it's outside our vision and it doesn't happen, it's an unknown unknown. It gives us a lot of problems because it remains there as a threat. If it happens and it's inside our vision, we've got an operational emergency. If it happens and it's outside our vision, it's a black swan. So what's the most important thing there? It's the limitation of our vision. It's actually a rather key issue. And what we should be thinking about is our vision and how we extend our vision in terms of what happens. So if we come back to the financial crisis, it, it wasn't really a black swan, was it? It, it? We, you know, people actually talked about it. Some people made money out of it, right? It's not that mankind as a whole didn't know it was a possibility. We all knew there were subprime mortgages going into products in the United States. The whole system was based on trying to oversell in a market in which as soon as things got tougher for some of those borrowers, they were going to default on those mortgages. We all knew that. Now, it was obscured a bit, but what affected us was the bubble. It was the chance we could make a lot of money, especially the bankers, and then we could obscure the product by selling it on, all wrapped up nicely. And so the whole system was the problem. But it wasn't really, a, really a black swan. It was completely and utterly a possibility. Okay? So you could say it had a small perceived probability, but the problem is a line of sight probably doesn't notice it until we get to a point where it's shooting up. It comes into our line of sight for a very quick period, and it's about at a disaster point by that point. <coughs> so what we should be doing more is scanning that horizon before that happens, shouldn't we? We should be considering the scenarios that might lead to it much more. So whilst we all do risk analysis, we don't do very much scenario work. Still tends to be associated with traditional high-risk industries and not standard practice. We don't force that horizon scanning activity, which actually would be much more important in decision-making than trying to predict. 
do I care what the mythical figure is for the possibility of something taking place? What I'm concerned with is what threats are on the horizon. What's the extent of them? Have I applied enough precautionary principles against the range of them? So we need awareness, we need multiple views from different perspectives, we need infrastructure for rapid processing and decision making, and we need to plan scenarios. We need to take extremes on what might happen. We need to combine them, we need to explore them, and we need to make our position then proof against them. Which isn't really a prediction situation at all, is it? Not in the conventional sense of prediction. But actually it's much more important than prediction to protect us against high impact events. So risk management's got lots and lots of problems associated with it. For example, we know that it keeps failing, that's easy. We know there's an inherent flaw in the approach because it's reactive. It assumes that risks will occur and that we can predict them and reduce the probability of them or contain them. We, but to do that, we have to be able to conceive the risk in the first place. If we can't conceive the risk, it's not in our risk analysis. Black swan, by definition, <coughs> not in our risk analysis. It ignores the complexity, it ignores loading issues and stability, it ignores black swans. And it assumes that we've got perfect information in the process, which we don't have under any circumstances, and that management's given attention in real time to what's going on none of which is true. And then we came up with this idea of enterprise risk management to try and solve the problems of the failures of risk management. The idea was that we were going to unify the risks in the organisation at the board level from all the different risk silos that might threaten the organisation into one place. And that's going to be the board because only the board is at that level in the organisation. But actually it's not really being used very effectively, it's being used for compliance in financial services and it's the letter of the law or the regulation rather than effective risk, it seems. So, there's another couple of problems here which are more statistical in nature. This one is that we tend to maximise things. We like maximising or minimising things. We like to maximise efficiency. We like to minimise cost. We like to maximise throughput. Because we work with probability and risk, we think in terms of maximisation. Okay? Now, of course, if you maximise efficiency, what do you do, by and large? You create fragility. Think of a doctor's surgery. You allow 10 minute slots in the doctor's surgery, one patient that's more serious and the whole system falls over. Think of the pinch points on the railway network in the UK. Exactly the same. One train gets late going through, the whole lot fall down behind it. It's happening today. Okay? Think of Heathrow Airport or think of New York or London gridlock. One of the problems is that if we focus on maximisation and minimisation and all the sort of nice standard straightforward methods that we have arising out of statistical thinking, we get the wrong answer because we tend to be unidimensional. There's a relationship after all between the efficiency of a process and the fragility of the process. When a process is very inefficient, it tends to be quite fragile, it tends to stop a lot. But when it's very, very efficient, one small disruption causes it to fall over as well. And you could say there's a useful efficiency range here, which we wouldn't want to go beyond. And then the other thing which is interesting is we tend, tend to rely on expectation a lot. Now, expectation is an averaging process, and averaging when you've got extreme events is never a good idea, of course. So, if we do any cost calculation, and we do an expected cost as a basis for decision-making, again, 
the extreme of the cost could destroy the organisation in most real problems. But we work on expectation as opposed to applying precautionary principles against the worst that might be happening. So anti-fragility comes from lots of places. Um, we're anti-fragile. Learning helps, therefore, with it. Awareness, information, good information, flexibility, agility, taking decisions, shared risk, spread risk. It comes out of our strategy and our culture and all the rest of it. We try and create safeguarding systems. Uh, we have ISO 9001. We have verification systems that try and protect the organisation, but the problem is we kind of hardwire those as well. So just as a conveyor system is fragile, because you can't actually change things very much if things change around you, a lot of the sort of ISO systems and the other protection systems share that problem too. Actually, we have fragile, anti-fragile features. Uh, they're they're anti-fragile features having a checking system, like internal audit, but if we implement it in a way that's very fragile, it's not very good. And often, these become formalised rituals. They become an aspect of middle management, where it's a compliance check. We check compliance in a ritualised way with very little attention from anybody else. It's automated. So, I won't get you to do this, but you might like to think about these questions. You know, how fragile is my organisation? You know, how good is our approach? How do we include deliberate diversity of approach? One of the ways you get anti-fragility is, is diversity. Nature, remember, tends to be very anti-fragile. And in each generation, of course, we throw up diversity as the basis of evolution. That diversity means something should survive. Good anti-fragile principle, good precautionary principle. How aware are we of the environment? Do we learn and do we implement? Do we learn fast? Do we have the infrastructure for learning? And do we evolve? And the more optimised our processes are, the more at risk we are. So there are things we can do about this. Um, for instance, it would push you away from automation. It would push you towards engaging, using that human feature. You see, it's an interesting debate about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence can ape our decision-making very well. But actually, it's the engagement of the individuals, which is the safeguarding systems. It's not actually just the decision-making process. It's actually the ownership which provides part of that protection in the system. Uh, foul often and small, use diversity, stress tests, etc. Now, my experience would suggest that organisations that are fragile don't know it. They think they're pretty good. And they're not joined up. Though they know and they don't do, or they do risk management in this formalised way. Lots of short-terminism, lots of bureaucracy and control. Not good at change. Non-transparent, weak processes, ignoring customers, etc. You can measure this stuff. It, it, it actually comes down to numbers. What's interesting about anti-fragility is it's kind of a negative acceleration calculation. Now, what do I mean by negative acceleration? Well, if you think about efficiency in any one particular area, let's take people, you can think of utilisation or output per head. Fragility might be absenteeism or turnover. Robustness would be attendance and retention we'd measure, but anti-fragility would be the rate of decline in absenteeism and turnover. So we're becoming anti-fragile, we're becoming better. So it's kind of a negative acceleration factor. And of course, when we talk about that negative acceleration, it could be against time or it could be against stress level. Obviously, stress level would give us more information, but we can't always do it, so time tends to be useful. 